Kiefer, we had a great word from Ed. Now we're also going to jump into our continuing series from the book of Acts. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, I do want to encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 13. And uh, don't worry, it's going to be a, a short, uh, short little time here. We're just looking at a few verses, Acts 13. And, and one of the things that I've loved about this series is we've seen how the birth of the church has been recorded through the pages of Acts. And we've seen how they've uh, embraced uh, the, the, the Holy Spirit in their midst and how the Holy Spirit provided them power. But it wasn't power like maybe we would define it in our world today. It was power to withstand oppression. It was power to stand true in the midst of opposition. It was power to find peace in the midst of the chaos. It was power to be able to stand firm when imprisoned. Right? It's power to recognize that it's not about being in control. It's not about uh, having the dominance in culture. It's actually about saying, how do we follow Jesus? And what is Jesus inviting us to be? What is faithfulness in the midst of a world around us that doesn't always look like Christ? So it's, a, it's about power to be as witnesses in Jerusalem, Genera, Je, Ju, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the world. Power. And it's not about dominance, but it's actually about showing his love. Oftentimes it's from the underside of the dominant power's foot. It's where we actually be able to have the power to be witnesses to the spirit. And in Acts, we see that playing out in real time. So today, we have Acts chapter 13. It's been a couple weeks since we were, we, we, we were here. Last week, we celebrated Thanksgiving, and we had our uh, Thanksgiving experience. Uh, if you are here in the house and you missed that in, pres in, you know, in person, I left the envelopes there. Uh, feel free to grab one of those and, and work through. We worked through some reflection exercises around Thanksgiving and around what God's up to in our lives. Uh, and feel free. You can do that. You can grab one of those. There is a pen included. Even if you just want a pen, feel free to grab one of those envelopes. Uh, but I encourage you to take some time to work through those, those reflection exercises. And hopefully it moves you to gratitude, a deep-rooted gratitude. But then, again, this week we're diving back in. So uh, just I'm going to start in verse 25 of chapter 12, and then we're just going to read down to the end of uh, verse 5. So when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Now, I just want to continue for a couple more verses. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, in, in these verses, we see at the beginning, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission. It kind of gives us a tone. So in, in the early church, already you see that they cared about what they were up to with an urgency that they're going to finish what they start. That they're going to finish what they start. There's a character coming through in those who would be identified as leaders in the church. It's a mission. They're going to finish what they start. They're going to put uh, their whole self into it. And then we see them return to Jerusalem, and they bring along John Mark. A little, a little note. So you have Saul, Barnabas, and they bring back John Mark with them. Now, uh, the, the church at Antioch, they're there, and we see this picture, right, where they're uh, praying, they're worshiping, they're fasting, and the Holy Spirit speaks to them in community. He speaks to them in community. Sometimes there's uh, thoughts around how vision comes and sometimes we think that there's a charismatic leader that goes into a prayer closet and gets struck by lightning 
and then comes out and proclaims the word of the Lord for all to hear. The Holy Spirit told me, so you better follow. Right? The Holy Spirit said it, so get out of my way. The Holy Spirit said it, so get on board. Well, friends, uh, before I was called to serve here at Pelham Friends, there's a, a little illustration that pushes back against that, you know, uh, Mount, Mount of Olives type of situation where you go up and get the word of the Lord and you come down and then you share it with the people. For us, there was a, a church down near Windsor that wanted me to come to be their pastor. And you start thinking, oh, this would be a good church. Let me tell you, this church was about 2,000 people. And in that, I'm like, is that the Holy Spirit? No, that's my ego. That's my ego. And you know how I know it wasn't the Holy Spirit? Because Lindsay was like, there's no way we're going to Windsor. <laughs> there's no way. All any of you from Windsor, I love you. Because here's the thing. God's not going to call me where he's not also going to call my wife. God's not going to call me where he's not also going to call my wife. So in a similar sort of way, when we're talking about church family, we're talking about community, God's not going to call someone in the church, a leader, a pastor, where he's not also calling the people. And we see in here, it's not one person that comes and declares, hey, we're setting aside Paul and Barnabas. No, it's the community. It's the community. The Spirit speaks in the context of community as they're all seeking Christ. What's interesting there is that uh, when we think about that process of, I was comfortable saying, ah, I don't think God wants me to go to Windsor because we weren't united. But then we think about the process of coming here to Pelham Friends. I, I felt a sense of that, it, that I just thought it was good. Lindsay felt it was good. And then when we consider that when the congregation was polled, when there's a vote, you guys also felt it was good. Now, I won't say, I'm here because the Holy Spirit told me to be here, and so you better listen. But to an extent, when you think of all of those things where there's a sense of yes, I'm actually a little more comfortable saying, oh, maybe the, the Spirit's in me being here and us being a church together and what God's up to here isn't necessarily driven by Gary's agenda as the board chair or Janice's agenda, who helped lead the hiring committee, or my agenda, who was brought in, we actually have the Holy Spirit speaking to, in community. There's something beautiful about that. I'm comfortable saying, maybe God's up to something. Maybe God's up to something. What's interesting, again, is, what do we, where do we see the Holy Spirit speak to them? You better believe they aren't out pursuing their careers and they hear the Holy Spirit speak to them. They aren't binging Netflix, wondering why God's not talking to them. Right? They're not filling their ears with, uh, you know, rock and roll. They're actually oriented on God. They're saying we're actually seeking after Christ. We see that they're praying, that they're worshiping the Lord, they're fasting. And it's in that place that the Holy Spirit speaks to them. When we think about, sometimes we wonder, why isn't the Spirit leading me, guiding me, directing me? Sometimes we, our lives are just too loud and too busy and too full that we haven't actually set aside the space for the Spirit to speak. Sometimes we're too busy. And we see here again in the context of community, the Spirit speaks. Do you have people in your lives that you talk about big decisions, that you seek the Spirit together in community? Hopefully that can be, you know, in, in healthy circumstances, it's with your partner in life. 
you're able to reflect and say, what's the spirit leading and guiding and doing in this conversation? But then sometimes there's uh, larger groups. Maybe there's larger groups of friends that you bring your decision to. Uh, an, another, another circumstance for myself, I was working at a church in Guelph, and there was another church that had, had come and said, hey, would you come and be on staff with us? And so what I did, uh, there, there's within the, the Quaker practice, there's something called the Quaker Clearness Committee. And so I had surrounded myself with friends who knew me and loved me, but also were willing to seek the Spirit on my behalf. And we carved out space. We, we met and we talked and we, 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 we discussed this possibility of leaving a church that we love in order to you know, investigate this possibility of something else. I surrounded myself with people who loved me and loved God, and together we sought the Spirit in the context of community to seek clarity on a big decision in life. They sought in community, and they set aside time to do it, right? They were worshiping the Lord and fasting, and then the Holy Spirit spoke. They put themselves in a position to hear from the Holy Spirit. And then you see what the Spirit said. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Name some people. Not to, you know, free them up to pursue their agenda. Free them up to, to pursue what they want to do among you. No, free them up. I've set them apart for what I want to do, my work. There's something beautiful about being able to lay down our agendas and say, well, what is the Spirit up to today? And can we embrace that? Can we embrace that? It's interesting when the Holy Spirit language is confirmed in the context of community, oftentimes what will follow, the mission will be about what God's up to and not man's mission. Right? And there's something beautiful when you can all feel the sense of this is good and this is yes and the Spirit is in this and again, we just can discern that in the context of community. Not someone who, who's proclaiming from on a high, I've heard from God. Like, that doesn't necessarily sit well with me. But in this context, we see that the Spirit was speaking to them as a church family. And when I think about how we move forward, I would love to be able to say, hey, we, we move forward as, yeah, there's, sometimes there's decisions to be made by leaders and all the rest of that, but hopefully there's this idea that we are, tuning into the spirit as a body, as a family, as a community. And in the midst of that, we find again that it's not our mission, it's Christ's mission. Now what happens though? So they set them apart, the people pray for them. Verse 3, so after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So you see obedience. So when the spirit speaks, when there's a community dis discernment, process and you get to the end of that and you're like oh, i think the spirit's up to this and everyone's like yeah i think so too let's schedule it for two years from now no right when the spirit speaks and there's discernment and in the context of community we say yeah i think god's not doing this they respond and they say yes we're gonna do this we're gonna do this they make sure that they had leaders in place to cover them when they were gone i don't know would they, as a community, have been better served if Paul and Barnabas were there? Well, maybe. But they knew that Paul and Barnabas had a mission, and that mission was to go. And so they were sent. And then they go. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. Where's the activity there again? All the way through Acts, we've seen that it's the Holy Spirit that's driving activity. Right? All the way through Acts. What's dri driving the church? Well, it's the winds of the Spirit. So when we consider what's motivating us, what's moving us, hopefully, again, we're seeking the Spirit, being driven by the Spirit. But what, so what did they do? They went on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, sailed from there to Cyprus, and when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. When they arrived, they went and they proclaimed. They got after it. They didn't go unpack Right? We don't have, they don't have that in the text anyways. They didn't go have a nap first. They didn't go try to get acclimatized. They just went and got after it. They're like, if this is the spirit in our midst, if they're driving this, 
We just got to do it. We got to get after it. And so they did without delay. This is a reminder, friends, that when, whether it's in our individual lives, whether it's in our families, whether it's in our social groups, whether it's in our church family, when we distinctly hear the Holy Spirit speak, we get after it. We do it. We move into that. We walk in step with the Spirit. We don't delay. We don't delay. And we see that they're faithful to do it. Now, something here, too, that I find really interesting, and it's more implied in the text, and you'll see what I mean by that as I, as I talk about this. Do you remember, as we work through Acts, do you remember who this Paul character was? Well, he was first introduced as the one who was persecuting the church, right? But we also saw how he dramatically met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and then what happened? He went to Jerusalem. You remember he went and he was with Jerusalem. Who accepted him in Jerusalem? Does anyone remember? Barnabas. Barnabas. And then the text says that Saul went back to Tarsus, his hometown. We may recall that. Now, how did he re-enter the story? Do you guys remember that? Well, it was actually Barnabas. Barnabas went to Tarsus and said, Paul, you're coming with me. You're coming with me. So we see that even in the text so far, we see Barnabas chose to say, hey, Saul, you're coming with me. I'm going to disciple you. I'm going to disciple you. And again, that's not language that we see in the text, but that's what's going on, where Barnabas is inviting Saul to participate in mission with him and say, hey, come with me. Almost as if he says, follow me as I follow Christ. Because later we know Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. But you see Barnabas pulling him out and saying, hey, hey, you, I see leadership in you. Come and let me, let me just come and, and hone your craft on, you know, with me. And so they go together. But who else do we see in the text here? They are taking with them John Mark. So it's almost like we, in, in, in the process of Acts, we see Barnabas speaking into Paul's life. And then as a, as a pair, as a duo, they're speaking into John Mark's life. So he's joining them as a helper. And you know, if we get there later in the story, we see that John Mark actually takes on a, a, a role as a primary communicator later in the text. What we see is a discipleship journey going on already early here in the church. We see Barnabas discipling Paul, Paul and Barnabas together discipling John Mark. So the question that I just want you to reflect on, if, if in the early church, it was in relationship, life-on-life -life relationship, where again, Barnabas sought uh, Paul, even though the rest of the leaders were scared, Barnabas advocated for him. Hey, he's good. And he sought after him. He said, come with me. So the question is, do you have someone discipling you? Do you have someone discipling you? This is a step of discipleship. This is a part of a discipleship process. Listening to teaching, you know, the, the idea of a discipline, coming, meeting faithfully. But what about in your personal life? Who, I don't know all of you extremely well. So you can't say, I'm not discipling all of you as a primary discipler. So who's discipling you? Who is helping you as you follow Jesus? Who can you go and ask questions of? Who can you go and say, hey, can you pray for me because I got this going on? Who can you go and say, uh, I don't know, how do I deal with this? I got this interpersonal thing. What, what is the Jesus way? And then in, again, in community, you can listen to the Spirit and you can speak. And the person who may be more, more mature on the journey can speak into the person who's trying to say, I'm going after Christ. Who's discipling you? The second question is then, who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? We could ask Paul this question. Paul, who are you, who's discipling you? He'd say, Barnabas. Barnabas is discipling me. Okay, Paul, who are you discipling? Oh, John Mark. John Mark, we're bringing him along. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're pouring into his life. So we have this. And again, it's an undercurrent of the text, but it's pretty clearly coming through that we have this process of life on life. Hey, following Jesus is different than every other action in the world. No one else is going to help you learn how to follow Jesus but another Jesus follower. If you look for how, what are your attitudes supposed to be about anything under the sun, if you look for anywhere other than a fellow Jesus follower, you're going to get a weird answer. 
and it may create dissonance in your soul as you're saying, I want to follow Jesus, and yet I also really love money. I want to follow Jesus, and yet I also really love popularity. I want to follow Jesus, and yet I'm just building my brand. Following Jesus means, well, what does it mean to build Jesus' brand? Right? What does it mean to build his kingdom? What does it mean to do what he has us do? It's just a different world. It's a different conversation. It's a different focus for our lives. And we lo- you learn that in the context of a, an intentional relationship where we pass influence. Those who have learned a little bit share that with someone who's on a journey learning. And then they say, well, I want to share with someone else as well. I think it's beautiful as we see the Holy Spirit work in the midst of the church. We see leaders, you know, going out on mission. And we see this very clear discipleship process. And it falls to us to say, how now shall we live? In the context of trying to do church here. Well, friends, as I said earlier, I just pray that we will discern the Spirit and we would do so in the context of community. That we would have, and again, it's not about an overwhelming, like, let's steamroll the community because the Holy Spirit says that's not, that's the exact opposite. It's about bringing people along and saying, yeah, it seems good to the Spirit and to us. The Spirit speaks in the context of community, and then when the Spirit speaks, friends, we do it without delay. Let's just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you that we have a record of just the birth of the church. As it unfolds and as people try to figure out what does it mean to walk the Jesus path in their time and in their place, we see them wrestle with it. We see them struggle with it. We see how the Spirit works in the midst of it. And then we sit here today in 2021 in Font Hill and say, well, what does it mean to walk the Jesus path here, now? So we learn from those who have gone before. We learn from the pages of the text. And we say, well, what does this, how does this inform us? And so may we attune our thoughts to you. Holy Spirit, speak. Guide us, lead us as individuals and as a church family. And when you speak, may we be obedient. May we get after it. May we do it without delay. And then I just pray that we would reflect on this whole idea of discipleship. And we'd say, hey, these examples we see in the Bible are pretty good examples. So who's disciple me and how can I disciple? Lord Jesus, may you bring to mind for each person here. Maybe help people identify who in their life could step into more of a role as we're all trying to follow Jesus in this way. We love you. Jesus, have your way among us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.